Well, I loved that talk. I am so excited to get more into these sort of sort of sticky um, these sticky safety discussions, and particularly the perceptions around safety because those are very important. But now. We're gonna jump into solving for the black box. So earlier today, you heard a lot of references to open source and open source technology. And I think one of the questions that I have leading into Jake's talk is how we value the social contract of making things open source and building this field. So he's gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, Jake is one of my friends. Uh, he works at Ginkgo Bioworks. He's awesome. He makes the best internet memes and he has a lot of very, very, um, you know, he has a lot of really great thoughts on uh, solving for the black box and open sourcing technologies. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, everybody. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to start. I'm going to lay some praise on New Harvest, on the organizers, try to ingratiate myself a little bit. The best thing about coming to a conference like New Harvest, here's what it is, okay? So you're, you're, you're wherever you're from, right? You're out there, you're all by yourself. You've got some idea in your head. Something's bothering you, right? Some, little, some big, unfocused, you know, yeah, dumb thought we need to do. And then you come here and somebody's really smart and they just nail it. They just say exactly the same thing that you've been thinking of. And it's like, yes, yes. That's what it is. And now it's not just something I think it's important, it's something we think is important. Uh, and it's very powerful. This has been happening for me all day long. Uh, it happened this morning at uh, Leggy Gafour's talk when he said, we need to share foundational frameworks. We need to find a way to share our foundational frameworks. Yes, yes, that's it. Uh, and it happened again uh, right now at the, at the previous talk at Kim, Kim Ong's uh, talk. When, you know, remember that, that figure from the very beginning, that circle of brains? We've got to get out of our silos. We need to make the circle of brains. Yes, that's it. That's the figure. Okay, so I promised the organizers that I was going to give an edgy talk. I'm going to give an edgy talk. So we're going to, from safety, we're going to get dangerous. A little dangerous, I, at least for me. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. Maybe I'll look a little stupid. That's okay, but I want you to come, on, come with me on this journey as I ask the question, who is gonna build the future? Who the fuck is gonna build the future? Right, and oh, that's a straightforward question. It's actually kind of scary because I'm out here living in 2022 in this post-apocalyptic hellscape of crumbling institutions Decaying social trust, right? The economy sucks. Even a good nonprofit like New Harvest having trouble raising money. So a lot of the, the stock answers to this question, the classical answers, uh, they don't sound that good anymore, right? Oh, is it going to be? It's going to be tech companies, right? It's going to be Jeff Bezos, right? And maybe not. Uh, but on the flip side, what we are trying to build is very important. It's very good. Cell ag is worth the struggle if we can just figure out how to deliver on it. Is it going to be a few big companies? Is it going to be a lot of little companies? What's the role for a nonprofit? What's, what's the role for open source? Uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we need to make a religious cult, right? So the children of the meat. <laughs> We're going to worship bioreactors, right? That's a kind of an organization. Maybe it's that. I would be open to that if it can deliver. If it can deliver. Okay. That's, a di that's, uh, that's not where this talk is going. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a different, that'll be a different uh, talk. But, so, but that's the question. And I, I think that now is a very, now is the right historical moment to ask this question, because I think that the way that we develop technologies in biology is changing, and I think a big part of that is this company that I work for called Ginkgo Bioworks. So something happened at Ginkgo Bioworks, changes the way that we do technology, it changes the way that we should organize this ecosystem. And what happened is that we figured out 
how to get really good at programming cells. We figured it out. So step one is you invest in scale. You need lots of robots, lots of automation to bring down the cost per operation. Step two is you've got to build out a code base. This is your knowledge base. It's your data. So that every time you do a project, you get better at doing the next project. And then step three is you have to open up that platform to developers like you so that everybody can benefit from this virtuous cycle. More programs, more operation, bigger scale, lower costs. This is the moment when, where we are today in synthetic biology, and I want to have this conversation with you, the developers. How are we going to build this ecosystem? What's the role for a platform like Ginkgo? So I'm a scientist by training, so when I think about this question, I like to put the technology at the center. And so, you know, maybe that's, that's kind of obvious. I know there's a lot of tech people here, but it, it's not just a tech problem. We need cultural change, we need political change, it's legal, it's economic. But I like to center the tech, because it focuses my thinking. The question is, how do we organize to deliver this tech, this tech, uh, and then how do we organize to distribute it for the most possible social good? That's the question. Okay, so what do we need? What do we need tech-wise in Cell Ag? This is my personal wish list. First of all, we need to diversify. We need more and cheaper feedstocks. We hate serum. We gotta improve the serum-free medium. Big part of that is growth factors. We need more growth factor bioproduction to bring down the price of growth factors. That's actually relatively easy. We can do that today. If you want to start that company, talk to me, because that's a great platform company. Okay. Uh, there are probably, there's, there's going to be dozens of them. All of them are going to be company scale bioproduction projects. It's a huge endeavor. That's not enough. We also need to diversify the feedstocks themselves, the carbon and the nitrogen and the amino acid sources that are the bulk of the bioproduction process. Right? I need these babies eating wood chips. Right? I want them eating lawn trimmings. That's, that's where we need to be. Maybe you can get there with a sort of like a pre-processing step. You know, you're you're going to convert that, that junk into whatever it is that your cells like to eat. Probably you're going to have to engineer the, the cells themselves for this feedstock switching. This is a core metabolic need uh, for, our, for our cell lines. We gotta intensify the bioproduction processes. This has come up a lot today. We need to get those, those high yielding lines. We need to, get to, to, to push on that, uh, that viscosity limit, that 25% weight by volume yield. This is also a fundamental engineering challenge. Maybe you can get there by modulating growth factors, but you know, this, is about, this is about adhesion, this is about waste recycling, catabolite repression, uh, very fundamental processes but probably are going to require some cell engineering. Uh, and then finally, we need to scale up. We need new formats of bioreactor. And that's come up today uh, quite a bit too. So we've got these sort of legacy bioreactor systems. We're pushing them as hard as we can. We're hitting these physical chemical limits. It's about oxygen transfer. It's about heat, right? Whatever it is. Uh, we're, 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 we've, we've gone as far as we can with these format of bioreactors, right? So maybe it's, think, what, what about these airlift bioreactors? That seemed cool, I learned about that today. So maybe it's that, but you're gonna engineer the cells so that they can tolerate the shear forces in an airlift bioreactor. Maybe that's a thing. Uh, maybe, you, maybe, maybe it's a vascular system, right? Why can't, a, why can't a, a, a cell line have a vascular system or a heart? That's how cows do it. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe there's an immune system we can put in there to cut down on the sterility costs, right? That's how cows do it. Learn from the cows. Uh, that's a big ask, I know. Uh, maybe it's a little crazy, maybe it's not. But the reason that I'm, I lay out my, my tech wish list for Cell Ag, it's not because I want to prescribe a particular R&D program, right? I don't know what's going to break through. You're the developers, that's your job. You, you, you figure that out. 
but inst I like to sort of go through these possible futures because I think that there's a pattern here. I think that there's a, a particular shape for the technology that we need for cell ag that is gonna constrain the way that we need to organize. So I think that there's a pattern unique to cell ag. And I think that the pattern looks something like this. So first of all, quite obviously, a lot of these projects that we need to do are gonna be expensive and they're gonna be risky. They're expensive. These are, these are like, these are biopharma R&D budgets, right? It's like 10 million is the minimum buy-in, right? It's a big deal. They're gonna be risky. A lot of these have a high failure rate. Uh, producing a growth factors, that's not too risky if you wanna do that. That seems relatively low risk. But a lot of these are gonna be very risky. So you look at that, you say, okay, well, it's expensive, it's risky. We have an ecosystem for that, right? That's VC, that's what VCs do. But look at the other, the other structure of this technology. This is, this is bio, where everything is always more than the, the sum of its parts. So in particular, a lot of the, the phenotypes that we need are gonna be redundant. A lot of these problems inherently have multiple solutions. There's not just one way to produce a growth factor. There's not just one way to engineer a high yielding cell line. There's not just one way to design a bioreactor. So there's, not, there's no way to just to invent a particular solution and then lock it down with IP and, and get exclusivity. When your product is insulin, insulin is the, that's the solution. You have to have insulin. And if you patent insulin, that's it, right? You, you, you win the game, you get your billion X uh, multi multiplier. Cell egg is just not gonna work like that. You're never gonna have exclusivity on your IP. You're never gonna have the only product. So you have to have the best product. Uh, and then finally, a lot of the solutions that we need are inevitably gonna be multiplex. Meaning that we need to combine many ideas, many different IPs from different teams into a single pipeline, into a single product in order to get the very best performance. It's gonna be one team that engineers out the, the growth factors. It's gonna be one team that solves the shear force problem. It's gonna be three different teams that solve the feedstock switching problem. Uh, and then and the, the best product, the, act, the, the cell ag that actually saves the world is gonna have to combine all of that IP together into that one thing, and so therefore this ecosystem, it needs, there needs to be some force in the ecosystem, some aggregator of all of that IP into a single uh, solution, right? Um, and this is bio, by the way. So if you want to combine, combining two different technologies into one technology, that's like a whole new thing, right? That's a whole nother project. It's not just like, it's not like Netflix, where you, you, you just buy out a library of titles and then you have a good library, right? If you wanna put two superheroes in a movie, you have to license both superheroes and then you have to make the fucking movie, right? It's a whole new, it's a whole new thing. So whatever it is that's aggregating that technology, it needs to be smart. It needs to be, it needs to be its own uh, uh, R&D powerhouse. Okay, so those are the constraints as I see them. Now let's, let's try on some ecosystems for size to see uh, what kind of ecosystems might, might fit or work with this. The classical way to do this kind of big R&D project is vertically integrated. This is how pharma invented drugs before all of us were born. This is how it used to be, right? It's one gigantic company that takes it, the entire process from the idea, they demonstrate the proof of concept, they iterate it on it to make it work really well, then they produce it and bring it to market. The incentives here are clear. It's one company, right? They do, they do all the work, they get all the, the profit. The, the execution problem here is clear because you have one organization uh, to, to build this, this machine for beating hard tech. You have this one centralized organization that, that can actually execute. Uh, the problem comes at the innovation stage. Uh, because if this company doesn't have all of the good ideas inside of it, uh, well then you're screwed. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna do those ideas. 
Biotech VC solves this problem by dividing that early stage part of the ecosystem into lots of little companies, each one advancing a particular isolated IP. Most of them fail. Some of them succeed in a big way. They make enough money to pay the VCs, and then they sell to a bigger company like a pharma company who can actually finish the job through from iteration to dis distribution. Um, the, I think, so the, the problem with this model for, for our ecosystem is that it's way too siloed. It's, it's atomized. It relies on each of these individual companies uh, solving the same problem in many cases over and over again. Uh, and at least one of those IPs has to pay off in a huge, huge way. So there has to be some, somebody has to win the lottery uh, in order for this VC-like uh, system to work. So you say, okay, screw IP, right? It's holding us back. We got all, everybody's we're solving the same problems, right? It's all we're gonna, it's, uh, we just need to share, right? I mean, we're trying to save the freaking world, right? Why can't we, why can't we just, why can't we just share what we're doing? So you think, okay, well maybe an open source ecosystem is the answer. So here you have, the idea is if you can just break down the problem into small enough units, uh, you can divide it up against different players, many of whom don't have to be for profit, right? There could be some companies, they could be specializing in different parts of the process, maybe some of them are selling services, but some of these could be non-profits, some of them are governments, some of them are academics, right? That's, that's how an open source ecosystem works. The, the problem here is that in bio, these nodes are really, really hard. They're big and expensive, right? These aren't Wikipedia edits. They're not Git pushes. Uh, these are multi-million dollar laboratory R&D projects uh, that not very many people can do. So th the problem that I see with this, this sort of open source model is that it lacks, uh, uh, it lacks an execution center. It lacks uh, a place where hard tech uh, can be solved in a big, big way. So what if we take something like this, and then I'm just, okay, now, now, okay, call me crazy. Call me crazy. What if we take something like this, and we just cram a foundry into the middle of it? What if we look at this ecosystem as a platform-driven ecosystem of developers? So now you can still have, like in biotech, these small companies innovating, creating their own ideas, bringing them through to the proof of concept stage. But when it comes time to iterate on them, uh, in a big way, you have a single execution partner that can deliver on that execution, you don't need to have a hundred different small co's all trying to save, solve the same problem. So in this analogy, uh, the, the foundry, it's like an operating system. It's much easier to build an app for an operating system than to build your own operating system from scratch. Uh, and it's much easier for two different apps to work together if they were written for the same operating system. Right, it standardizes them. So it facilitates that kind of exchange and sharing. So if there is a model for Cell Ag where we are sharing our foundational frameworks, if there's a model where we're out of our silos, uh, if there's an open innovation model, I think that you need to include uh, the foundry in the shape of that, that ecosystem. That's all I've got. That's as far as I've actually. That's as far as I've taken this idea. I was thinking about it this morning. I couldn't get. I couldn't get it any further. <laughs> um, maybe I'm wrong. So, please find me later. Tell me why. Tell me why I'm wrong. I'd be happy to hear it. But I'm just gonna. I'm gonna leave you uh, on a few other questions about this. This kind of structure that are on my mind. So questions are: What in Cell ag development needs to be centralized and what needs to be distributed. 
what needs to be open and what needs to be proprietary. And then I'm just gonna put one little plug, because the last one here, this is actually my job. This is my actual job. Uh, what do you as developers need? What is your wish list for a foundry uh, like Ginkgo's? I wanna start the conversation um, and, and see if I can meet the needs of, uh, of this developer community. And with that, I say thank you. That was awesome um, and very inspiring. And there's a lot to think about there. Wow, my voice is disappearing. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Um, I'll try to hold it together till the end of the day. Um, OK, so top question is, what is Ginkgo then doing to democratize the Ginkgo code base? No, I, yeah, so this, is, so this is a fair question. Um, so. We are not democratizing the code base. Um, I, I don't think that's that's the right word, right? So democratize means give it to everyone, give it to everyone for free. Um, the code base that's our that's our business model. That's mm -hmm. our that's that's the reason why uh, the platform can function. Uh, it's the reason why Ginkgo is able to scale. It's the reason why we're able to learn from our projects and then offer that that knowledge to make future projects more efficient. So democratize is not the right word. It's live. It's somewhere in between, right? It's not. It's not fully proprietary. It's not open source. Um, it's not just for us, but it's also not for the whole world. It's for. It's for the developers. It's for the developers community. Yeah, it's a complicated question. Yeah, I think that that leads into the next question, which is how how then does it does does something like this work with sort of the platform business model? Because I think the the picture that you sketched out where we put, you know, we leverage, it, a lot of this is about leveraging existing infrastructure and not reinventing the wheel over and over again. And so when we talk about helping developers move through Ginkgo's platform or a foundry model, or even as we start to think about scaling up bioprocesses and other places where technology is going to develop, um, how does that work within the business model? Do you take partial ownership of IP? Is that something that you're still figuring out? Um, and one of the things that I think this question is pointing towards is people are looking for, people are looking for a model. Like I think we're interested in doing this, but it's like cool. So, how does it work in in everyone's interests? How do we make that work? Yeah, I so I can I mean I can I can talk about Ginkgo's existing business model and the way that we work with developers on a kind of one to one basis, um, and. Catch, catch me later. I'll be I'll be happy to, to tell you about that. That's that's kind of not what I'm trying to get at mm. uh, in this talk. I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine something that's a little bit bigger, a little bit more open, uh, and something that I don't quite understand yet. So uh, there are words like words like open innovation, right? Mm. Where you have it's a kind of a it's maybe it's a it's a walled garden, right? It's a place where you have you have cooperation within the terms of a particular agreement. So you, it's a, you have a sort of partially proprietary space and a partially uh, open space. It's something that would facilitate the cooperation, enough cooperation between different partners so that we didn't have to constantly reinvent the wheel, mm. but would also ensure that people are being rewarded for their, for their hard work. Uh, and their and their contributions. So I can't uh, I can't tell you what that model looks like because I because I don't know and it doesn't exist yet. But I'd like to uh, I'd like to hear from you about it. Well, this definitely points to some of the ideas you've been getting at around like you know switching the paradigm from users, right? So framed one way, you've got a platform and there are users of that platform. Framed another way, you know you have a product that's coming from that platform and those are consumers of that product. But I think this has been pointed to in open source software ecosystems, which we talked a little bit about earlier, where we're sort of trying to shift the perspective from thinking of ourselves as users or consumers to co-developers, right? So how are we co-developing the ecosystem on the foundry? It's the question of, you know, who the fuck is going to build the future? Okay, we are. Okay, so how do we do that together, right? Um, and so I think this is really interesting. And, and I think maybe one of the things that, that folks struggle with here is, I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know that, that current business structures 
the pharmaceutical model you pointed to that is largely built around IP and, and hyper-competitiveness um, necessarily takes into account the social contract that we're all embarking on together to sort of build this future together. And so this points to another one of these questions that I think I saw that might have that might have gone away, but it's like, you know, how do we how do we propagate that instead of sort of the the momentum and the bias that is behind this? Um, uh, I don't know if that's a very coherent question, but I, I and think that's a very big question, right? It's it's more of like a yeah. conversation starter than a like you're going to have the answer to that right now. But <laughs> no, I I know I, I, I it's a very it's a very I think it's a very big question. It's a very it's a very fair question, and I think I see some of the other the other questions in the chat yeah. that are sort of that are along on the same lines, yeah. right? And it's sort of where does where does a platform live in the space between proprietary vertical business model and open source sharing utopia business model? How do you how do you think about that that answer? Um, and uh, Jesus, I don't know. I really don't. Uh, I think that. Uh, Part of it comes down to incentives, mm -hmm. the question of incentives. So uh, I think that a, a platform business model in biotech uh, has the right incentives mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, what are our incentives? We want to execute your project well. We want to deliver the tech that you want. We want your company to succeed because we participate in that uh, success. Uh, it's not adversarial, it's not an acquisition, it's not a zero-sum negotiation. We're not, we're, not, we're not buying your IP, we're not taking your IP from you in some sort of negotiation where every dollar that you lose, we win. Uh, so I think that the incentives for a biotech platform are the right incentives. It's, 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 it's cooperation, right? We, both, we, we can both win. I love that. Um, I think we're, well, this is a conversation that I think is going to continue throughout the conference. I love the conversation that this has sparked and the questions that this has sparked from the community. I think we're going to have a lot more discussion around this, um, but we are currently keeping people from their next coffee break. So I think we're going to move into the coffee break, but Jake, this was awesome and gave us a lot to think about. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. My friends, you are, you are free, but please come back at 3.30 for the next talk. We're going to be getting into some of the awesome work being done by New Harvest's own fellows.